gotta find your people The ones that make you fall right The kind you wanna stay up with all night You gotta find your people The ones that make you feel whole They won't you leave your side when you lose control The ones that don't let you lose your soul You gotta find your people The ones that get your joke The ones that stand what you say for a word in this moment You gotta, you gotta find your people That put, put the feeling in the room When you look ahead, you got nothing to lose When you look ahead, you got nothing to lose Then you'll find yourself You gotta, you gotta find your people That call your blood Who ride along when the road is love You gotta find your people The ones that make you feel equal And the ones that you love don't you down You gotta find your way to the light You gotta find your way to the Well, good morning. Let's stand. Come on in if you're out in the foyer. Summer in Maine. Hope that you're enjoying it. We open our services with a particular tradition here at Pathway. We pray for other communities of faith here in the great state of Maine. Today we're praying for Holy Family Church in Lewiston and a number of people that are now part of Pathway. They kind of trace their roots to their introduction to Jesus back to this particular community of faith. So we celebrate all those that name the name Jesus. Let's, uh, let's pray for these guys. Lord, thank you. We celebrate the Church of Jesus Christ, Lord. It's, it's a tapestry of Catholic and Protestant alike, Lord, that have been faithful for generations to speak of the claims of Jesus Christ, to invite people into relationship with their creator through the work of Jesus Christ. So we thank you for this community of faith, Lord. We pray for them as well as us and all those that name the name Jesus. Let our inspiration continue to arise from two places, the truth of your word and the infilling of your Holy Spirit. Great blessing over them today. Lord, and for us, we come uh, before you with an offering of worship this morning. We know you're here. So Holy Spirit, we invite you to make us aware of your presence. I pray you would start that even now as we offer you this time of worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, say hi to the person beside you. Let's worship.
speak a blessing over this room and this atmosphere right now. God, we thank you. And we bless what you are doing in this room. Whew. I just, I saw a wave of his power and his presence and his glory. And it was rolling through this room. And it was just in capturing all of you in this warm, this tidal wave of his presence. And so, Father, we thank you for that and we bless that right now and we pray for more. In Jesus' name, and we release it. Amen. All right, please be seated. Well, my name is Seth, and that was Marie. Thank you, Marie. All right, well, this morning, so glad to be with you. Good to worship with you guys today. Uh, if you came in with a tithe or an offering, please give, uh, do. Put it, I mean, I'm like all caught off. <laughs> Whew, take a breath. On the way out, there's boxes everywhere. Put it, put it in one of those boxes or give online, electronically, website, church center app, all that good stuff. But uh, I'm just so thankful for what God's doing right now with us. So I do pray more, Lord, and I pray, God, would you bless all that's given in your mighty name. Amen. All right, let's check out the screens for the upcoming announcements. Welcome to Pathway, we're glad you're here. My name is Malik, I'm on staff here at Pathway, and if you are new, we would love to connect with you. If you are tech savvy, you can scan the QR code using your smartphone and fill the connect card out right from your phone and see. If you prefer paper pen and people, we have a new and improved connect card just for you. We can see the upcoming events, Sign up for a prayer request, all while staying connected to our other campus and location. You can find these cards in the chair bags or the information booth. Regardless how you fill it out, come to the info booth. And every newcomer gets a gift just to say thank you for checking us out today. Sixth grade step up! Yeah, at Pathway, we love celebrating milestone moments. Going to sixth grade is definitely a milestone that we want to celebrate. We also want to pray and speak encouragement, protection, and strength over your child 
who is stepping into the sixth grade. Sign your middle schooler up using the Church Center app. See you there. Endurance, a combined summer team retreat with other area bigger churches at Pilgrim Pines in New Hampshire. Deadline to register is August 2nd. Sign your teams up using the Church Center app. See you at Endurance. Youth group, all open house, parents, teens, we invite you to youth group open house this fall, August 14th at 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Come and see what youth group is up to. Ask questions, play some games, all by getting to know your youth group leaders and members. Sign up using the Church Center app See you at Youth Group Open House. Summer Baptisms and Barbecue. Join us August 18th for our Summer Baptism and Barbecue on the Hill. As we celebrate, celebrate baptisms outside, we also will be breaking bread afterwards with a little, little barbecue. Sign, Sign up for baptism classes August 14th at 6.30 p.m. using the Church Center app. See you on the hill. Mm. And for our final segment, did you know Winter Harbor got its name because of how cold the winters are? Yet, our harbor will never, never freeze over. Created some of the freshest lobsters in the state. So much, the Winter Harbor Festival was created August 16, 1947, and has been held every year since. So if you will please stand, find a neighbor and ask them, they've been to Winter Harbor Lobster Festival. And as always, we hope you feel loved and welcome via yeah, Pathway. Let's gather back in. I'm going to fall off the stool here. All right. Well, welcome. My name's Alan. If you're visiting today, this is Sarah with me. Hear a little bit from her in just a moment. But if you've arrived today, you've uh, arrived at Pathway in the summer. And so we've paused from our uh, year-long journey through the book of John, which we'll pick back up the first week of September. We'll start back up with John chapter 8. But our summer series is something we like to do that just lets you get to know a little bit more about the people that sit beside you on a weekly basis here at Pathway. We call it telling God's story through the lives of people at Pathway. See, we believe that as the people of God, God writes his heart on his people. When an individual says yes to a journey with Jesus, the Holy Spirit not only 
breathes the gifts into life that he's placed into the life of a human being, but they, they are then able to express the very attributes of God through their life. Now, I believe that every human being has the ability to reflect God in that, the simple reason that we're all created in his image. But when we open ourselves up to a relationship with God through the work of Jesus Christ, our lives then gain the ability to participate in the work of God, as well as reflect his heart to the world around us. You know, if you, uh, for example, if you're wired with compassion as an individual, that compassion was placed in you by God. Now, certainly one can be compassionate without a journey with Jesus, but that compassion is limited in its scope and effectiveness when it's not rooted in a relationship with God. You take that same compassion and when one comes into a journey with Jesus, a relationship with God, things like compassion exponentially increase in their effect because they're then tied to eternal purpose. So today, uh, Sarah Doucette joins me to talk a little bit about how God is telling his story now through in the narrative of her life. As she said yes to Jesus, God has written his heart on hers. And as you will hear, God uh, is, is working through Sarah, things like advocacy, support, education, and compassionate care for a ve very, very vulnerable portion of society. Sarah's been, on, Sarah's been on her own journey of healing uh, from a very broken season of life and now is expressing God's empathy and compassion for others. Um, and it's being communicated because she's been courageous enough to say yes to his invitation. So Sarah, welcome, glad you're here. Yes, thanks for having me. Uh, how long have you been hanging around Pathway? <laughs> Um, so we, start, as a family, started coming here December of 2022. Uh, we moved to Lewiston, needed a new church family, and I remember coming here as a teenager a couple of times. I did youth group, and I think I even did the Christmas okay. nativity Christmas, at yeah. least once. Um, but yeah, so we started in 2022. So you, you grew up in and around the church. I mean, the fact that you were visiting churches as a teenager means that your family had some sense of... Uh, um, understanding of the of Jesus and that journey and um, you know like many of us that your, your youth was probably a mixture of both positive and maybe not so uh, positive experiences but despite man's uh, often bumbling and fumbling um, you did you would say that, and articulate to me that you did uh, develop some journey with God as, as a as a young person yeah, I, when I left for college, uh, I was very deep into, you know, Christianity and faith. Um, I was in church every Sunday. We would go in the morning. We would go at night. There was youth group once a week. Um, I was in Bible quiz, and um, I always say kind of the fun Christian party trick was I had this crazy memory. So I had memorized the book of Acts and could recite it backwards. Um, and so... Which she's going to do for us in just a minute. <laughs> Uh, definitely don't have that memory anymore, um, old age. Um, but I went to a Christian church school, um, and then when I left home, I left home to go to a Christian college, and um, this is where I met Stephen. Yeah, so you, uh, doing your schooling, uh, married at quite a young age, actually 20, 20 years of age, and um, that, that really is where our story begins to pick up and understanding of a, kind of a very broken season that you, uh, that you kind of stepped into there. Yeah, so... Uh, I met Stephen my sophomore year of college. Um, he didn't go to my college, but he was um, from the town, and he was friends with a lot of people that I knew uh, from school. Um, the guy was larger than life. He had just this huge personality, and you know, me coming from kind of a small town in Maine, um, had a very small circle um, growing up, right? It was all church, church people related. Um, I was really shy, and getting pulled into his orbit was just exciting. Um, he was the guy everybody wanted to be around, just extremely charismatic, um, and I was just shocked that he picked me. Mm. Um, I really couldn't believe it, and you know, I, I hadn't been allowed to date um, really until about my senior year 
of high school. And at that point, you know, I, I had one relationship. I think it lasted about a month, but I was leaving the state for college, so I didn't see much point in um, forming that kind of relationship and then leaving. So um, I, I met Stephen, and we dated for a year. We got engaged, and then we got married six months later. Um, and then, as I like to say, the honeymoon was over before it started. Yeah, sadly, uh, like the stories we've heard uh, before in, in that uh, you suddenly found yourself uh, in an abusive situation. And like many others uh, that find themselves, that have found themselves in that situation, you didn't necessarily have all the tools or self-awareness to even realize um, the depth of kind of the broken relationship that you were in and soon verbal and eventually physical assault became part um, of your experience. And some say that when they are, are in those environments, they at times will try to rationalize mm -hmm. and why that behavior is being directed towards them, mm -hmm. right? Maybe, is it something they're doing? Is there, are they somehow at fault? Are, are they doing something wrong? And uh, I, I'd ask you as we were pre pre prepping for this, just in my own curiosity, wondering was that part of, of your story in terms of your experience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, never, I never really identified as a victim of domestic violence or intimate partner violence during the actual relationship. Um, most of his actions were what I now identify as like psychological torture. Um, something would set him off you know, a dirty dish in the sink, dinner's not on the table in time, and then basically let the games begin. Um, he, so when I say psychological torture, I mean, there would be physical, there would be psychological abuse, you know, just hours of him berating me, um, and he would go quiet. And then it could be a day, it could be a week, and eventually something would happen, or sometimes nothing would happen. He would just, I don't know, forget about it or decide not to continue on the action, but the, the, the hard part of it was that I now lived in a fight or flight state until something happened, you know, waiting for the, the shoe to drop. Um, during the time, you know, the physical abuse was very um, subversive, um, so a lot of times what it would look like is, you know, him telling me that I toss and turn in bed too much and it would wake him up. And so then he would wake up and he would punch or kick me. Um, and I could easily rationalize that in my brain as, well, he just wakes up cranky. You know, he's not fully awake. He's not fully aware of what he's doing. Um, and so, you know, eventually, um, I would stay up until like two in the morning because it wasn't safe for me to go to bed until he was very, very deeply asleep. And trust me, he did not try to go to sleep early, right? He'd be in our room in our bed playing video games and I'm like out, you know, waiting to go to bed. Um, so to answer your question, well, in it, um, again, I told myself he just wakes up cranky, you know, so I need to be more accommodating to his slight sleeping. Um, and you know, so I started staying up later. Um, I just also really never had the language. Um, as I had grown up never really seeing domestic violence um, or hearing about it, um, other than, you know, like you sometimes see it depicted in a Lifetime movie, right? Which is, you get pushed down the stairs, you're caking on makeup, but that's just not the reality for most people out there. Um, and so I just kept telling myself, why is he so mean? Um, and it wasn't until I left and I started um, to go to therapy that I heard the term domestic violence, domestic abuse. Um, I did eventually officially receive a PTSD diagnosis or um, post-traumatic stress disorder, post-traumatic stress syndrome, um, as it's now more commonly called. Um, and a part of that disorder is disassociation. So. I really had truly deep down buried in my, my subconscious a lot of what had happened. Um, things that I never thought I would forget about, I did. Um, and it wasn't um, until really getting into therapy that um, I was able to kind of access some of those repressed memories. Um, it wasn't until we, we finally had a talk about getting divorced, and so I was like, okay, like we're on the same page, he wants out as well, he's not happy. Um, and so we had agreed we're going to get divorced, but I was living 
in Florida. I was from Maine, so I had no family around me. And um, I just said, well, I'm gonna move into the spare bedroom until I can find a place to go. Um, that was okay for a couple of days, about two to three days. Um, and then he came home one evening. Um, you know, he had been out drinking with some friends. I, I think other substances might have been involved, but I can't be sure. Um, and it just slowly escalated over hours of verbal abuse. Um, he had me trapped in a room. Um, and he would just come in and out, you know, yelling at me. Eventually, he started throwing items at me. Um, and, uh, you know, eventually physically assaulted me, slammed me up against a wall, um, and I just waited it out. And then um, finally he um, passed out. It was like two or three in the morning and I heard him snoring in the other room and I grabbed what I could and um, I left and never looked back. As a dad with a daughter, this is, you know, horrifying tale, but I think it's, uh, it's a story that needs to be told because uh, unlike, so much of this stuff happens, it, it, and it's silent in mm -hmm. terms of the people around you. Like, there's often an unawareness. It's not exposed. It's not something that is seen that can be spoken into. And yet you hit that breaking point, and you said that when, when you guys finally decided to talk about maybe the separation or an end to this was needed is when the violence really escalated. And so there, the, 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 you hit that mark, you leave, but then you find yourself alone. Mm -hmm. You're not at home, there's not family around, and after six years you had the courage to break free, but then you then end up having to really then deal with um, the reality of how the people around you would respond, and, and that wasn't an easy part of this journey either. Right, yeah, it was, it was difficult. Um, you know, one of the stories that usually comes to mind is a couple of weeks before the assault I had um, spoken to my mom and, and told her, I think, I think I'm getting divorced. And, you know, her response was, it's close to Christmas. You know, he always gets stressed around the holidays. Um, you know, just stick it out for a little while longer, let things calm down and see where you are. Um, and at the end of the day, like when, when people are in these situations, we don't, we don't share mm. openly. Right, like, you know, she had no idea how unsafe the situation was. Um, and, and so a lot of times, like, we don't, we don't have a network of people that we're openly talking to about what is going on because we're not ready yet. Um, and so it was a lot of people who just didn't understand um, that, like, there was no going back. Like, I, it, it was over, it was done. And I remember, you know, growing up, whenever you heard about divorce in, in the church, it was always, like, looked on really poorly. Um, and so I said nothing afterwards. Um, I left and I had no place to go, so I ended up, um, you know, living in my car, homeless for a few weeks. Um, again, like a lot of people had advice on how to fix my marriage, um, but it wasn't, that wasn't an option for me. His substance abuse was escalating, and as his substance abuse escalated, his obsession with guns and firearms would increase right along with it. So it was like weekly new firearms were coming into the house, and they were constantly out on the table. He's playing with them and cleaning them, and it was just an obsession. And my gut just told me I won't survive another couple of years with him, and so it was time to go. Yeah, I mean, sometimes the advice is... is from, from the outside coming in. I mean, you know, why don't you just sleep on the couch for a little while? That, that, like, that doesn't fix the situation when there's a threat of violence. Yeah, I mean, situation. when you know your husband won't kill you, sure, right. make sure. him sleep on the couch. But when you're not sure, that's not really an option. Sure. You told me that during this time that you weren't necessarily uh, angry with God, like, because I think the natural response in these moments where is God? God, where are you? Why would you let this happen? Why did this happen to me? What, where are you? Where's, where, where's the promises? And, um, and sometimes when we're in the heat of that moment, we, that, that's all we kind of left with our thoughts. And I think God's very patient and gracious with us to even be able to have those types of, of thoughts. And, and it, but, you know, by nature, him being a loving God, um, you know, things will eventually come into focus um, but you said that you, you didn't actually get mad with God, but you were confused, like, okay, maybe I just need to take more control of the situation. Mm -hmm. Like, if I don't feel like I'm being guided, I'll just take control, and you said that that wasn't necessarily an easy decision either along life's journey. Sometimes 
when we take control, we end up building a little bit, we compound the brokenness yeah. in our life. And, um, you know, there's a verse in the Bible that I believe to be true, but often takes us getting to the other side of a situation to really clearly understand it. But I do think it communicates the heart of God. And thank God that it does, because the psalmist, you know, writes this down, Psalm 10, 14. Um, have, you know, the psalmists are often writing from a place where they've had their own affliction. They've mm -hmm. had their own disappointments, their own questioning. And then it comes around because, uh, you know, I think when I read the psalms, I'm so comforted because God's not put off with kind of our, our complaining or whining or crying out. But if we, if we really have a heart after God, there's often then we can able to retreat to the solid ground that we're sure of, yeah. that he's a God of love. And it says in Psalm 10, 14, uh, the psalmist cries out, he says, but you, God, see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief and take it in hand. The victims commit themselves to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. And that fatherless can be represented in so many things, just that lack of overall godly support in our life. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to look a little bit about how God showed you his care even perhaps if you weren't fully uh, tracking with him in that season of life, you said to me that it was in that season of life that he actually gave you kind of a life verse, a, a yeah. verse out of the Bible that really began to give you a path forward. Yeah. Well, why don't you talk to us about that? Yeah, so, I mean, a path forward, but the verse, I mean, literally saved my life. So um, I was finally out of my car. I was in my own place, living from, on my own for the first time, and... Um, you know, kind of the survival mode was starting to calm down a little bit. Um, so I think about like the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So my basic needs were now met, food, shelter. Um, and so now like the, the, the thoughts could come in. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I started having a dream and I had the same dream over and over and over again. And it would wake me up every night and um, just the anxiety, and I was full-time grad student, I was full-time working, and I, I wasn't sleeping. And so my mental health was declining pretty rapidly. Um, I found myself, again, waking from the dream and just in despair. And I remember sitting on the floor in my apartment and just contemplating suicide. And, I, you know, I saw no way out of where I was at that time. Um, a lovely woman um, from work had given me a book um, weeks ago called What the Bible Says About Divorce. And I was not opening that book. <laughs> I was like, I know what the Bible says about divorce and it's not good. Um, but in that moment, I was like, well, you know what? It's right there on my bedside table where it had been sitting for a couple weeks. And I was like, I'm at the end anyway, so I'm just gonna open it. So I just remember picking it up. I mean, it was like this big. And I just opened up a random page and the first thing I saw was, um, an excerpt from Isaiah 49 and 17, um, and it said, the walls you're building are never out of my sight. Your builders are faster than your wreckers. The demolition crews are gone for good. Look up, look around, look well. See them all gathering, coming to you. And in that moment, um, being as type A as I am, um, I immediately grabbed notebook and paper and I started very similar to a pros and cons list, but it was a builders and a destroyers list. And I quickly identified my destroyer as, you know, Stephen. And I started writing down the people who were there building me up. And the list, you know, the builders were tenfold what my destroyers were. Um, and in that moment, I just had hope. Um, remembering that my employer had recently passed out flyers about an employee assistance program or an EAP program. Um, I reached for that brochure and was able to call a crisis line and get on the phone with someone that night. Um, and then they got me scheduled to go meet with a mental health professional the next day. Um, and that was actually my first tattoo, is your builders will be faster than your destroyers. So I just always remember. There were, there were other people in other um, moments in which God sh showed his care. Again, uh, it's easy to reflect, and that's why I think reflecting on our journey is so important. Yeah. Because in the moment, we sometimes wouldn't necessarily say, well, then God showed up and did this. Yeah. And, but then, as you sit here today, you're able to look back and to see how the Father was there mm -hmm. in your midst. Talk, talk a little bit about some of those people who were, who did become the builders that, 
that lifted, helped lift you from that place? Yeah, you know, they came from places I wasn't really expecting. Um, so as I mentioned before, I was, um, I was six months into a 16-month executive MBA program, and um, the people in that program were ended up being a lifesaver. A um, uh, little bit of girl power of 26 MBA students, 24 of us were women, um, and some were significantly older than me, some younger, but they quickly adopted me, mm -hmm. right? Um, they would show up to class with an extra microwave that they had or a coffee table they didn't need anymore. Um, some of them worked for the corporate offices of um, the major um, grocery chain Publix down there and they would, like they gave out gift cards for a thing, here's gift cards for groceries. So people just came and were helping me that didn't have to um, help me. Um, you know, I remember one day sitting in my apartment um, down to like the last few dollars in my checking account and being like, okay, I gotta get, gotta get to school. I gotta get to work. I gotta feed myself. Um, gotta get gas. How am I, how am I doing this? Um, and just kind of sitting there crunching numbers and trying to figure it out. Um, and something just told me, go check the mail. I'm like, why am I going to check the mail in the middle of the afternoon? And she's like, just go check the mail. I was like, okay, I'm gonna go check the mail. So, um, I went downstairs and I, I checked the mail. I go back up to my apartment, you know, just looking through things and I see an envelope with no return address and I open it up and someone who obviously knew what was going on had anonymously, anonymously sent me a check um, for like a significant amount of money. It was around $10,000. Mm. Um, and I mean, if it wasn't for that, I, I was contemplating dropping out of school and heading back home because I just wasn't making it um, and that you know, kept me going through the rest of my program. Yeah, I'm checking the mail on the way. <laughs> I just think those are all just, just really deposits of God looking out for you and, mm -hmm. and kind of knowing where, what he was going to invite you into uh, mm -hmm. going forward. And I think that's where I want to transition a little bit, Sarah, is talk a little bit about, um, you know, some of the things God has used in your healing journey, and then we'll finish it up with kind of some of the opportunities that he's given you today. Yeah. Um, I mean, finding a therapist I trust was a big deal, and it was really um, the most important thing that I have ever done. Um, I have been divorced 12 years now, and I still um, go to therapy every other week. Um, Can I just speak to that for yeah. a minute? Because I think sometimes, in, in unfortunately, in Western Christianity, um, things like uh, therapy and therapists are looked down upon. Like, well, that, you know, well, certainly God is enough to take care of our emotional and, and mental well-being, which he is. But just like God uses brilliant medical professionals to help our broken physical bodies, yeah. he also has blessed a group of people to help us with our mind and emotions. And I'm so happy that many in the Church of Jesus Christ are beginning to really understand to to holistically look at what God has offered us for support. Mm -hmm. And even in the vineyard, we're hearing more and more pastors just tap into things like spiritual directors and, and, and be into in therapy with, uh, with healthy counselors that are really yeah. helping with the marriages or PTSD or anything like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I definitely um, could not have done it on my own. Um, so, you know, I, with the, as I mentioned before, like the disassociation with memories. So one of the things that, again, is common with PTSD is, um, you know, having these triggers and you don't really know where it comes from, right? It's just um, all of a sudden you just feel anxious. You feel like the sense of dread. Um, and these are things and memories that are stored in your cellular, like it's in your body. It's not necessarily in your mind, it's in your body. Um, you know, like when someone raises their hand to you and you automatically duck. Like that's kind of what that's like. Um, but you know, therapy has allowed me to recognize a lot of the triggers and work through them with my therapist. So you know, I rarely get triggered anymore, though it does still happen, um, as some of my worship team members <laughs> witnessed one night. Um, and it comes out of nowhere and you don't necessarily know, but you have to just kind of keep working through it. So also finding purpose and a way to use my experiences has been really important for me because a lot of the confusion with God was kind of like, okay, what's the why? Right. Like there's gotta be something more here. And um, I remember shortly after we started coming to Pathway, it was in February, um, Phil had given a sermon um, on Peter. 
and he talked about using the comfort with which we were comforted to comfort others. It's a tongue twister. I don't know how you got through that sermon. <laughs> um, but, you know, here I am 10 years after getting divorced, and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, there's, there it is. Yeah. I, I, and, and that's, for me, what I view as really to pursue holistic healing. Use, use the individuals mm -hmm. that God has gifted or people uh, with the various abilities to help us. Use that. But be open to the move of the Holy Spirit as well. Yeah. And that, that sermon was used by God. That's the Spirit of God. The verse she's referencing is 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. And it says, praise be to God the, and the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received. And that's the beauty in this, is that we often don't understand the why in the midst of difficulties, mm -hmm. but uh, through the help of the Holy Spirit and the people God placed around us, sometimes those things become to, to come to focus. And we yeah. realize that I never wanna live that again. I don't wish that on anybody, mm -hmm. but God doesn't waste our pain. And if God, you can now use me to comfort someone else that may need comfort, then I say yes to that assignment. And, and you have. And so I, I want you to share with us some of the cool ways that you've been allowed to now really advocate uh, and help others that might be in a similar situation. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I was just opening my mouth and talking. Um, you know, so I started talking a little bit to, to people um, about what I had experienced, and I kept hearing, oh, you should write a book. You should write a book. So I wrote a book. Um, uh, so yeah, so I wrote a book. It's called uh, Stronger Than That, A Domestic Violent Survivor Uncovers the Truth About Her Abuser. Um, I have a few copies left. First service was very greedy. Just kidding. <laughs> um, out at the visitor center um, or the information desk, um, they, they go for $10 a copy, um, but if money's an issue, please just take one. Um, or you can buy them on Amazon um, for paperback, Kindle, Barnes and Noble online, and Sherman's and Topsum carries them locally. You I want appreciate to shop that small. you wrote that book. It was very helpful for me. I think you should all write a book. So when I say, hey, tell me a little <laughs> bit about yourself, you can just hand me a book. That's, that's <laughs> so. um, and then, you know, the, the book um, kind of got picked, got noticed by a few people. So I've been doing um, podcast interviews. Um, so uh, the book does fall into the true crime genre, just um, for you know full disclosure. Uh, my ex-husband um, was a criminal. Um, he had committed financial crimes against me during our man marriage. So I'm a survivor of financial and economic abuse as well as physical and emotional abuse. Um, and he eventually did get um, caught for his crimes, and um, unfortunately, he did um, die by suicide, um, went out on bond. So, um, on top of that, um, I recently self-published um, kind of like a guided journal. It's available on Amazon. It's just a trauma recovery journal. Um, so, like I said, I felt writing really helped me reintegrate a lot of memories, but writing on a blank sheet of paper can be really intimidating. So, it's just, you know, what are three things you're physically feeling? Three things you're emotionally feeling? What are three things you see to like reconnect yourself to like the present and then some free space to write what your, what memory is coming up for you and, and things like that. Um, advocacy work, um, I've been on a couple of boards. Um, currently I'm on the board of an organization called Together Her Invested. Um, we focus on um, helping women who are getting out of situations going through divorce. We have a whole network of lawyers, social workers, advocates, um, even like former judges. Like there's a whole, whole um, group of people there for that. Um, and then I started um, a quarterly thing with them called Waking Up to Wealth. Um, I was a financial advisor for a while. And so um, I teach women kind of finance 101 um, and to kind of rebuild that relationship with money because we all have some sort of money trauma, whether you know it or not, you probably do. Um, and then, um, you know, just lending my voice when needed. Um, recent incidents in, in Auburn, um, 
laid heavy on my heart, so I published an op-ed in the Sun Journal about protecting victims and um, you know other random public speaking as people will um, have me. I'm currently working on a new project. Um, I, I'm gonna be dropping a, a podcast this fall called Stronger Than That. Um, so I'll tell my story and then I have a lineup of other men and women who have survived something and were stronger than that, whatever their that was. And so they'll be telling their stories. Um, and then I'm just completely blessed that another organization called Beautiful Feet Wellness, um, and I connected, they're based out of Colorado, um, and so I'm writing a curriculum for them, again, Finance 101, but I'm gonna be helping um, survivors of human trafficking who are also controlled by finances and money and um, you know, don't know how to, to do any of that yeah. stuff. Um, so that's, that's a new venture that's coming shortly. So I'm really excited to work with them. I asked Sarah what she does in her spare time, you know, because <laughs> it's, uh, it, and not everybody that, 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 that God brings, uh, you know, through seasons like this end up with that type of advocacy. But for you, it's been part of your journey and it, and it is, and it still contributes to your, your own healing. Absolutely. In a sense. Um, it's amazing how when we reach out to others, how we're often reached back to by God in, in terms of a, of a healing environment. And, and so I, I, you know, I'm just so proud of you and appreciate your courage and appreciate your willingness to, um, to, to tell your story, um, but to also tell it in a way that I think inspires hope for people. Mm -hmm. And um, so tell us, uh, let's close with this. Why don't you tell us a little bit about where you're at today? What's the family dynamic like for you today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, my, I do have a day job. Um, <laughs> um, I'm a consultant for the Department of Defense, um, specifically Navy contracts. And then I have an amazing husband who you saw up here playing bass, um, Tom. And, you know, he supported me through everything. He was there when I was writing the book, sitting in the hallway, biting his nails as I was like interviewing um, people <laughs> yeah. for the book. Um, and, you know, putting up with some of my odd trauma triggers because we've been together for six years. So, you know, he's seen some, some weird stuff, but, um, you know, he's gracious and um, we have a great time. And then uh, we have an amazing daughter who some of you probably seen running through the pews after service, um, Nyla. She just turned two and she just makes our little family complete. Um, and uh, yeah, she'll give you a fist bump or a high five and she, she's obsessed with Derek every time she sees him. She's like, Derek! And she goes back and gives him a fist bump over the soundboard, so yeah. I love that. I love it when, when you see our children feeling at home in this space. Yeah. And, and for some of them, they'll become memories that become part of their story going forward. Um, you know, we're gonna end this way. Why don't we stand and uh, give Sarah a round of applause. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> I think she's got a, a few remaining copies of her book out there if you like, but there's a QR code on the thing. You can also get it online if, it's, if there's none available. But, um, uh, you know, know this, you know, talks like this can often stir up some things based upon people's own life experience. And I know I, uh, I asked Sarah if I could speak for her in that. Um, she also wants to be a resource to Pathway. Like, you might find yourself in a situation and sometimes just having someone to go to and talk, so whether that's Sarah, or that's myself, or that's the pastoral staff here at Pathway, um, you know, nobody, no human being, male or female, should be in an environment where there's verbal, psychological, or physical abuse, ever, never. And so we want to be, the Church of Jesus Christ should be a place that it's safe to, to seek help, to find help, and we're committed to that. And so I'm gonna invite a prayer team to come up if, the, if those individuals that are on for today would, would come up. Um, if Sarah's story resonated with you in any way and you would just like some prayer, um, I know uh, her or any of these individuals would pray for you this morning or you may have something going on today totally outside even the realm of what we just talked about. Uh, physical healing is needed or something like that. We would love to pray for anything that you would like us to pray for before you depart today. But particularly, I would say, if, if her story resonated with you, you might be a parent just concerned about the well-being of, of a child that you have and the situation that they find that you're, themselves in. You may have a friend, and you're just praying for, how do I help? How do I, I suspect something, but how do I even broach a conversation to, 
to perhaps help. I think, uh, you know, communication is the key in this. And having environments where you know it's safe to speak um, it, with, with the potential help awaiting behind the words that you share. So we would love to, uh, to help in any way that we can. Let me close us out, and then if you'd like prayer, come on up front. Lord, thank you. For, first of all, thank you for Sarah. Lord, thank you for, uh, thank you for, Lord, that her life story is still being written. And Lord, that you are still writing your heart for her on her heart, Lord. And so we pray for just more courage and more energy and more vision and uh, just, Lord, we, we thank you that she's uh, willing to say, I will take the story of my life and use it in a way uh, to, to, to the, the comfort that I experience. I will use my life in such a way to comfort others along this journey. We thank you for that. We just pray you continue to equip her, resource her, give her and Tom all the grace they need for the journey that you've invited them on to. Lord, we pray for this community of faith. We pray for those today that might be silently suffering. Lord, we pray for intervention, for healing, for freedom from, from, from harmful situations, Lord. Miraculous intervention. Lord, I, I thank you for this community of faith. That it's an environment in which people can feel comfortable to share their story as we press into you, inviting you to write your story over even the difficult things of our life. So come, Holy Spirit, have your way with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like prayer for anything, come on down, say hi. God bless you guys. We'll see you on the journey.